the wave nature of matter. We talked a little bit about um, quantum mechanics and that idea of superposition. Um, and Schrodinger's cat, the thought experiment, helps us to understand that it's ridiculous to think of this in terms of normal sized objects that we can see. A cat can't be dead and alive. But when you get to the very small particles, they can be in more than one condition at the same time. So, Louis de Broglie proposed back in 1924 that particles could have wave-like character in addition to their particle character. And we've seen that with light. We saw that light acts as a wave. It, it undergoes diffraction and, and creates those interference patterns. But remember the guy with the box on the beach. Um, it also acts like a particle, and we learned about that when we talked about the photoelectric effect and how individual packets of light called photons cause the ejection of electrons. So now this is the proposal that electrons, which are particles, can also act as waves. And we see this most clearly when we look at electron diffraction. Um, we observe that a, an interference pattern similar to what's observed with light forms. And it's important to understand this is caused not by pairs of electrons interfering with each other, but single electrons interfering with themselves. And that's the wave nature of the electron. And this experiment was proof that electrons have wave nature. So we can do a double slit experiment with electrons. So over here we have a source of electrons, and we have electrons um, being shot at this barrier that has two slits. And what is observed is a, an interference pattern similar to what is observed with light. And this, this indicates that um, electrons are behaving as waves do. If the electrons were only behaving like particles, we should see two bright lines. Because as the particles are shot here, would the ones that go through would hit the target, and the ones that hit this barrier would be stopped. And there should be no interference pattern, just two bright lines. The wave nature of the electron is an inherent property of individual electrons. Well, if something is a wave, it must have a wavelength. And de Broglie predicted that the, wave, the wavelength of a particle is inversely proportional to its velocity. So this is the de Broglie relation. Let's pick a better color than that. So the wavelength of a particle is equal to <coughs> Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity. So we, using that relation, we can um, calculate the wavelength of particles. Um, so what's the wavelength of, I'm sorry, what's the velocity of an electron that has a de Broglie wavelength approximately the length of a chemical bond? Assume this length to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. So they're telling us that the wavelength is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And we want to know the velocity. I'm sorry, that, whoops, what happened? I was, velocity is um, the, what we're looking for. So the de Broglie relation says that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity. Yes? Are we using that mass? Pardon me? Are we using mass? Um, we have not been given the mass. That's true. Could we look up the mass of an electron? Mm hmm One way to do that 
is the mass of an electron? Come on. What is the mass of an electron? Here is what I found. Sometimes she's helpful, sometimes she isn't. Come on, Siri. Uh, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. That's the mass. Um, does anybody remember what Planck's constant is? I think it's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And so we end up with some really bizarre looking units here, but um, rearranging this equation, we get velocity is equal to Planck's constant divided by mass times wavelength. Planck's constant being 6.63 times 10 to the 34. Um, joule seconds. A joule is, For a class this early, I should have written notes. A joule is a newton meter, I believe. Yeah. So joules per second is um, newton times meter times second. This could get ugly. And a newton is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, I think. Kilogram meters squared per second squared. Yeah, so let's, so joule kilogram meters squared per second squared times second. That's our, our joule second unit there. This is just fun with units. Um, the mass down here is 9.11 times 10 to the 31 kilograms and the wavelength was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. In problems like this it's really really important to put your units in because in this instance they gave us the wavelength in meters and meters ends up showing up in here. But if they gave it to us in, in centimeters or nanometers or something, we would need to convert that. When we looked up the mass of the electron, it came up in kilograms. But if we found it in grams, we'd have to convert because we need these units to simplify a bit here. So kilograms meter squared per second squared times second, this one of those seconds cancels out. The kilogram is canceling out. And one of those meters is canceling with this meter. This is a good sign that we're doing something right because we're ending up with a unit of meters per second, which is an appropriate velocity unit. Now, it's a matter of putting this into your calculator. Um, so we've got 6.63 EE minus 34 divided by 9.11 EE minus 31 divided by 1.2 EE minus 10 and calculator is showing me 6 oh I want you to show that what I want to see this in scientific notation because that's just ridiculous Six point. Um, how many sig figs we've got going on? Two. Six point one times ten to the sixth meters per second. Anybody else come up with that number? That's good. 
especially a calculation like that, punch it through your calculator twice to make sure you come up with the same answer. Is that a reasonable speed for a, an electron? You think electrons move slowly or quickly? Probably quickly, right? Pretty fast. So 6 times 10 to the 6 meters per second seems reasonable. If we got, you know, 6 times 10 to the minus 12 meters per second, not reasonable. Electrons just like going at a snail's pace, literally, not reasonable. Any questions? So one of the things you need to be able to do um, is to take that, this relation, and be able to combine that with other equations to find stuff out. Um, you know, E equals um, kinetic energy is the mass times the velocity squared. Um, we had lambda was C over the frequency. All of those things, you could be given a problem where you have to use more than one of those equations. And you need to be able to think about things. It's not a matter of I teach you how to solve one kind of problem, and then I give you a problem like that on the final, on the final or on the exam. Whenever I jump around like that, I risk missing a slide. Okay, the uncertainty principle. So when you try to observe the wave nature of the electron, you can't observe its particle nature and vice versa. And this is the, the part about opening the box with the cat in it. You force it into one state or the other. It can only un be in superposition in two states at once when it's not being observed. So we have the wave nature of the electron is evidenced by the interference pattern. The particle nature is evidenced by its position. If we try to figure out which slit the electron is going through, we're forcing it to act like a particle. And so the wave and the particle nature are said to be complementary properties. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other. And this is the uncertainty principle. So if we take that same experiment with the slits and the electrons going through, but now we put a laser beam behind the slit so that when an electron goes through the laser beam, we can see it and we can identify which slit it went through. The interference pattern goes away and we see two slits, uh, two lines. Just the act of putting the laser beam here forces the electron to act like a particle because we're observing it. And so anytime we design an experiment to observe it as a particle or observe it as a wave, it, 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 it messes things up. So we're trying to look at the particle, then it acts like a particle and not a wave. It's almost like they're being contrary on purpose, but of course they aren't. But I do think of electrons as very squirrely little things, very unpredictable um, and just hard to understand, and you just kind of have to deal with them the best that you can, sort of like small children. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, somewhat quantifies this. So here we have um, delta x. X uh, reflects the position of the electron. Um, delta X um, is a measure of the uncertainty in the position. So how uncertain are we are, are about that position? The uncertainty in the position times the mass times the uncertainty in the volume. I'm sorry, the velocity. Where did that come from? V is the velocity. Delta V is the uncertainty in the velocity. If we take those two numbers and multiply them, it has to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Now, where did that come from? Well, Heisenberg figured it out. What's important about this is that if we know the position of the electron with some certainty, if this is a small number, 
then the uncertainty in the velocity has to be a large number. If we know the velocity, because we could measure its wavelength, if this is a small number, then the uncertainty in the position is large. So we can know where it is or how fast it's moving, but we cannot know both. And the more closely you know one, the less you know about the other. We can't simultaneously measure the position and the velocity of an electron. Now, in classical physics, sometimes called Newtonian physics, which I'm very fond of, by the way, um, particles move in a path that's determined by their velocity, their position, and the forces acting on it. And that's called determinacy. The present determines the future. What that particle is experiencing right now determines where it's going to go in the future. That is something that we understand on a basic level, even if you've never had physics, just because of your experience with everyday objects. Experience rolling a ball across the floor as a child. You learn this. That is not how the um, extremely small particles act. Because we can't know the velocity and the path, we cannot predict um, because we can't know the position and the velocity, we can't predict the path. That's called indeterminacy. The future can only be described statistically. We can't predict exactly what it's going to do. We can only say, well, it's probably going to do this. But that doesn't mean it has to. So here we have um, a baseball player hitting a baseball. And there's a trajectory. And, you know, it's hit with a force at an angle, and it goes up, and there's a force of gravity on it. There's wind resistance. There's the mass of the ball. And we can predict where the ball is going to go. And we have learned that in everyday life. Someone throws a ball at us, and we can predict, some people better than others, where that ball is going to land. And we can move and stick our mitt out and catch the ball. because. The present circumstances of the ball predict where it's going to go in the future. It doesn't work that way with electrons. So classical trajectory, very predictable. Quantum mechanical probability distribution map says, well, it's probably in this region somewhere, but we can't say exactly where. So if a baseball pitcher pitches the ball, exactly the same way every time. It's going to go to the same place, and the catcher just has to stick his glove out, and the ball comes. If you were to throw an electron the same way, at the same angle, the same velocity, it would not go the same place every time. And that should be a bit disturbing. That doesn't make sense. These very small particles do not obey the same rules that larger particles do. So if you're pitching electrons, the best you can do is make observations. Each of these spots is like a time lapse or a multiple exposure photograph, where each of these represents one pitch of an electron, and that's where it went. And we see that it's more likely to go into this small area but it could be in this area as well. And it's even possible that it's up here. That's possible. Improbable, but possible. And so we can look at a distribution, the number of particles and the distance from the center of the strike zone. So the probability of the number of particles hitting in the center is higher, and as you go away, it drops off but we can't say for certain that it's going to hit within a specific area. Does anybody have any questions about that? <laughs> 